Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan Varsay, president of the America Israel Friendship League. Thank you for joining us today. As we start, I would like to ask you to let us know where you are joining us from. Please write in the chat window. We always like to see these. One answer to a recurring question is that yes, we will be posting a recording of the session for your continued enjoyment and sharing with others. And also, if you have a question, please do write us in the chat, time permitting, we'll bring these up to the panel as they are addressed. This is another webinar that we are streaming during this period. Throughout these webinars, we are focusing on messages of hope, unity, compassion, and optimism. Over the years, Amos Nahum, a world-renowned wildlife photographer, has focused his efforts to show that we can live in harmony with big animals, a different, different perspective of hope, unity, and compassion. In recent years, Jonathan Neal and Danny Menken created a documentary about the life of Amos Nahum. They are with us today all to share with us on this wonderful story. Amos is a wildlife photographer and explorer and he came to us and came to this career after a distinguished service in the IDF in what we call today a special force unit, Sayal Tchawuf. During some of the most difficult years facing Israel's security culminating with the Yom Kippur War. Yonatan Neil is a documentary filmmaker who grew up in a kibbutz and he too served in a special force unit during which he was injured during the second war in Lebanon in the midst of clearing out a minefield. His injury and PTSD brought him to the world of making documentaries to help the protagonist as well as the audience to understand this and cope with the psychological impact of PTSD. Danny Menke is also an award-winning documentary filmmaker, including Dolphin Boy and On the Map. Danny has collaborated with Jonathan on making this movie. Before we start this movie, I would like to take a moment to thank the, Israel, the Israeli consulate, the cultural, uh, cultural uh, consulate in supporting this event. I'm excited to say that the consulate is providing us with 100 tickets to view the movie. So please do tell us in the chat if you would like to receive a ticket and your email so that we can send it to or contact us. Uh, or you, alternatively, you can contact us at ifl.org, info at ifl.org, and we'll be happy to send you the viewing information. Before starting, what I would like to do is start with the, uh, with the trailer of the movie. Amos, to me, is uh, one of the best ambassadors of the ocean. It takes huge amount of risk to bring those images which nobody else has ever been able to capture. He comes back with images that no one can get. He is probably the best underwater still photographer in the world. His story was always shred in mystery. He doesn't have a normal life. He doesn't have children. He's married to the ocean. He has this passion. He wants to be in the water, close to pull over, swim with the biggest predator on Earth. If the wind is too turbulent, we're not going to go there. There's so many factors that can work against you. All right, guys, we're taking off. Carlos and his team have only five days to find a polar bear and take the picture. It's the one animal where humans are part of their food chain. People get eaten by polar bears. He needs that adrenaline rush. He needs to be at the edge. And if he doesn't do it in one way, he'll do it in another way. And maybe his military background has part to do with it. I'm 
wonder if there is some kind of unfinished business with Paul out there. Believing in yourself, and go all the way with the matter what else. And this is all the power of being. <laughs> Or just okay. I apologize, but um, not many people have the privilege, basically, of a documentary being made about their life. How does it feel? I feel privileged. Mm -hmm and I uh, feel very, very uh, proud of the team and to prove that a team of people work together with honesty and dedication can achieve more than anything else. Almost like the movie Gladiator. It is only in the team, it is only in the work of so many people between Danny and Yoni and Adam Ravitch that we need to mention here. And of course, the family of Joe Kalujak, the Inuit family, um, which we were able to create something as such and to come to result that second to none um, in the world of wildlife photography. And the story of my life, as um, Yoni and Danny did, uh, this effect of so many other people, touch so many other people's life that had very similar, especially in this case in Israel, but not only in Israel, because many other countries had people that served in the war and had PTSD for different reasons. So if it helps somebody else uh, to overcome it, I, I'm really privileged to be the person that through, through me, the story was told. Thank you. Jonathan, why Amos? I mean, what made you choose to make a movie about him? Well, the first thing is the pictures. You know, you, you see the pictures and you're just like, okay, I want to know this man. How did he do that? How do you get that close to a blue whale, the largest creature ever lived on this planet? 30 meters long and 170 tons. And uh, the heart of a blue whale is as large as a small beetle, uh, how do you call this small uh, uh, car, the, the beetle, uh, Volkswagen beetle. That's the heart of a blue whale. And I was came so close to this animal, about 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters from this animal, which is also very, very shy. So the first thing that attracted me was the pictures. And then it was interesting for me to try to understand who's the man behind the pictures. And the funny thing is that we started to work on this documentary, Danny and I, uh, even before we made our first documentary, Dolphin Boy. I met Amos, I really wanted to make a story about him, to make a film about him. Uh, and then Danny was interested in that too. We got to know each other through Amos basically, but the, but, the, but the film was so complicated and so expensive to produce. So we had to kind of postpone it. And Danny asked me, do you have another idea about a story about men and nature and the connection between them? And then, I said, yeah, there is a story in the dolphin bo in the dolphin reef in a lot. And that led Danny and I to make another film called Dolphin Boy, which was our first film. So the story of Amos is pretty much 10 years in the making since we started to, to shoot. It took 10 years to complete it. Um, and I'm, I'm very glad that, uh, you know, I was a part of it because it's, it's an important story for me. Definitely. Uh, Danny, um, you know, I was actually going to show here a snippet from another movie that you made actually uh, on the map, but unfortunately, uh, we actually are having some technical issues over here with uh, with uh, sharing of the the other. But uh, but uh, you know, but just by way of background, on the map is another documentary 
uh, about an inspirational uh, time period. We were just talking about it uh, just before the uh, just before the session started about Maccabi Tel Aviv and the 1977 championship, and um, the uh, and how sort of that brought together a whole nation. Uh, bottom line is, though, uh, you make inspirational movies. Uh, you make documentaries about inspirational uh, periods and inspirational pe uh, periods and people. Uh, does this documentary about Amos fall into that kind of category? Um, yes, absolutely. Jonathan, like um, Jonathan mentioned before, we uh, started to work on uh, the story of Amos, and that's how we actually got to know each other. I made a film called 39 Pounds of Love that was on HBO, and it was the Israeli Academy Award, and it was shortlisted for the Oscars. So I was known to be the guy that doing, is doing road trip films, and that's how uh, I was approached by a studio to make the story of Amos and met with Jonathan, and then we started to work on this together, uh, and it took so long for us to raise the budget because it was such a, a big undertaking and put together the story that in between we have done another film called Dolphin Boy uh, that thank God uh, we're very, very proud of and, and was very successful. So the idea is to capture stories if you're talking about some certain elements and maybe on the map can relate to that as well or... Uh, uh, other films that we have worked on either together or separately is that, and I believe that's true also to what Jonathan is doing, is follow someone that is kind of an underdog and is trying to overcome his challenges and, uh, and uh, going through some kind of redemption in his life while achieving his goals, his dreams. And that was the one thing that captured us uh, by Amos, you know, he really inspired us uh, by his character, uh, by his determination, by the price that he's willing to pay, and by the wounds that he has from his past, from his life, that he bravely um, was willing to share with us uh, during this journey. Thanks. No, definitely. I, I... Um, so almost really, I mean, with all of this, what brought you to the world of big animals? Hmm. <laughs> well, I, I must say here before that, that almost about three days ago or four days ago, it was exactly five years celebration for making of the movie and encountering the mother and her two cubs underwater. So again, thank you, Danny, Yoni, Adam, and Kaluchek family. It's five years anniversary. It is monumental what happened there. And what makes me go after the big animal, it is as a wildlife photographer, and I choose to work underwater. But I'm a photographer. I'm not a diver first. I'm just a photographer or explorer, an explorer. But in the, while you work in any field, I felt either will be in high tech, either will be in medicine, either will be in banking or money. You need to have a specialty or niche to make you outstanding and to make, to make your profession really desired and be able to be successful or to be known for. So while working underwater and one choice and then focusing on a big animal was in order to get a niche to myself. What I found out and the reason I went after the big animal is that when I checked previous work of what was done in the, in the late 80s and 90s, I realized the attention was relatively negative, mostly negative, a lot of fear, a lot of um, misconception about animal, which I had already relatively good experience or positive experience. Then I took it much more under myself, not just to take pictures, but also to bring people with me and focusing on animal behavior, not just picture of animals, which really make the all different in the world until today. It is to bring, uh, to create more of connection and more de deliver the emotion that in me, through the picture to the public and create more apathy and more connection for protection of the animal and for the environment that we are living in. Interesting. So, 
Yoni, I know that you got your training in minefields, mind clear and mind clearing, <laughs> literally. <laughs> and you can't tell me that working with these polar bears and sharks was not scary. And Amos has been doing this, you know, for 40 years. I mean, you, what, what brought you to this? I mean, I mean, I, I would imagine that after clearing mines, you know, that that would be enough for you. I mean, and do you have any interesting sh stories you can share with us? Um, yeah, I spent a couple of years in, um, you know, in, a, in what you call special forces unit uh, and um, in Israel specialized in, in, mine, in clear, mine clearance, basically, and demolitions and stuff like that. And after that, I went traveling. I needed to go traveling for a long time to kind of do something else. And I find myself traveling for seven years. And during this time, I, of course, I didn't tr only travel. I worked as a diving in instructor in different places around the world. And I had a, a business, a seasonal business in the United States. And um, as time passed, I realized that I, I have a lot of experiences traveling and seeing the world. And I want to share it. And I want to remember it. And then I realized that I can take the camera and take pictures. And by taking pictures, I basically create myself the memories that I want to remember. And that was uh, the beginning of my career as a photojournalist. And I worked as a, for a couple of years as a photojournalist. So I was an underwater photographer before, and I had the privilege to dive with sharks, whale sharks, mantas, even orcas, um, and dolphins, of course, many dolphins. Um, but the idea of diving with polar bears was something, of course, that I didn't, I didn't even have a clue how to, uh, start to produce something like that. It came from Amos, not from me or from Danny. And neither Danny nor I knew how to do that. So we had to contact Adam Ravich, who was an amazing, amazing cinematographer, probably the best Arctic cinematographer in the world. And luckily he is a good friend of Amos. Amos was his mentor back in the eighties. So when we contacted Adam, he said, yes, if Amos asked me to, to do something, I do it, no questions. And then for months and months and months, we had to work on preparing this operation. And this is where I think my, um, my, my, you know, my, my training in, in the army was good for me because I, I, was, I knew how to pre prepare myself and to prepare a team for such a complicated operation. We're talking about thousands of items that we needed to take with us more than two two tons of equipment that we need to f needed to fly to this really remote location. Um, and you have to have this combination between, you know, between, between knowing that you, you want to come with a very um, strict, is, uh, you know, plan. You, you want to have plan A and plan B and plan C. But in the end of the day, you are somewhere in the Arctic and everything can happen. And you have zero control. Um, so in this kind of situation, what you have to look after is basically, you know, you, you look at your team and that's the most important thing. We, we work with a very small team of people that trust each other. Danny and I had, had a lot of experience together. Amos and I had a lot of experience together. Amos and Adam had a lot of, a lot of experience and Adam and the Inuit family had a lot of experience together. So this way, we trusted each other. Not saying that we didn't have any conflicts, we didn't have any problems on the way. Yes, we did. But we knew that we sit together and with full transparency and with open heart and open mind, we can solve everything. And we had enough, a, a common background and we had a specific goal to look for. And we knew that we want to create something positive, something with hope, something that will lead more people to love nature, to love the animals that we must protect. So that was the goal. And um, that's how we, we, we got through all the troubles and all the, all the difficulties and the obstacles on the way. Wow. Danny, from your perspective? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, it, it was just a, a huge challenge, you know, as Jonathan said. Uh, personally, for me, as you know, I and much more experience in basketball court. I'm, I'm coming from the sport <laughs> world <laughs> and not, and not uh, in the Arctic. I mean, you have to see that we took, I think, 
Six, seven connections? How much it was, Jonathan? Like, uh, seven, seven, from, seven from San Francisco and nine from Israel. Nine flights I mean, from Israel. It was like just way. too That's much. One. And then, yeah, and, and after doing all that, when you will see the movie, which, um, again, thank you for the consulate for uh, donating 100 tickets. Whoever wants to uh, see the movie, we are uh, showing it on our website, on pictureofhislife.com. Uh, so please uh, check we it out getting, and spread the we word, are, are getting, word of mouth, you, labor of love. What? No, no, we are getting, uh, as we're speaking, we're getting lots of people on the chat uh, ask, submitting their requests, and we will compile all of those, and uh, we'll pass those on to the consulate, definitely. So okay. we're, we're, you're going get, to be getting a lot of viewers over here, th uh, thanks to the uh, consulate for their cultural affairs. But uh, so, so, so all of you will go to pictureofhislife.com or we'll get it for, um, from the generous donation from the Israeli consulate. We'll be able to see if this effort was, was worth it because you know, if you see in the movie, after we took all those connection flights, we had to take another small tiny plane for us and the, and the equipment. And if you've seen that dude that took us on that plane, uh, you will not go on an Uber with him. You know, it, it's, it was really uh, pretty crazy. And when I had to go to the bathroom, I had to take Jonathan with me and do Inuits. Uh, that, and, and no, not to mention there were no bathrooms. And, and, and one of our uh, executive producer um, that helped us in this film is Nancy Spielberg. She's the sister of somebody named Steven. I don't know if you heard about him. He's a director, made a movie 40 years ago named Jaws. And uh, I was in, in many ways wanted to portray a, a great white shark and big animals differently than, than what uh, Steven Spielberg did on, on jazz. However, we were four Jews there, Jonathan, uh, Amos, Adam Ravitch, Danny Menkin. So we thought maybe we should call the movie Jews at some point, uh, but we sticked with a picture of his life and then uh, we really put all our heart and soul in it because we really wanted to show two things. A, the story of Amos. So we called it Picture of His Life because it was not just Picture of His Life for Amos. It was really Jonathan and I trying to portray the men behind the image. In, in many ways, we really wanted to show also the story of somebody that uh, was a soldier in the Israeli army and he had to use a weapon and he transformed to be a soldier of mother nature and, and, and replace the weapon right now uh, with the camera. And now he's showing uh, the beauty of the world. So that's one of the nice things that we're trying to show from Israel. And, uh, and I hope uh, we did a good job. I mean, we're very proud of it. We got great reviews. And I really hope uh, the people that will watch the film will love it just as much as we I have. Think so. uh, no, definitely. And you're talking about Jaws, and this, I think, is an image not from the movie, but actually from Amos's uh, uh, camera. Amos, how did you get that shark to smile? <laughs> I did not get it. The shark, the shark is smiling all the time. The only problem is that the way which how we run businesses. And many businesses today are not running according with Mother Nature or recording with the right ecology in mind. Uh, in this case, uh, opposite that all other operators, I went to the water without bait and without chum. So the sh I did not antagonize the shark. I did not make him angry or upset or uh, aggravated by coming to the cage and taking the bait out of his mouth. We went without any of this element. So when I faced the shark face to face, he did not even care about, well, he cared about me because he just smiled at me. <laughs> he did not do anything else. And what is interesting in this picture, if anyone photographer in the crowd that listening to us today, I took this picture with normal lens, normal lens meaning 60 millimeter lens, and it's called normal because it's the same view as our eyes see. So that means that what I wanted to relate to the 99% of the population, over 7 billion, 900 million people in the world that will not go diving, this is how a great white look when you don't put bait in the water, when you go uh, naturally, uh, but you need a good guide. And that's what we did. 
On the other hand, though, some might argue that actually maybe you were the bait. But, they can argue that, but the fact of the matter is not. I've taken with me over 400 people or more. We're diving out of the cage. Unfortunately, it's not allowed anymore because of commercial operator did not like what I do because they think it will be dangerous to people. However, so far, there is more shark get wounded by hitting against the cages than diving with the shark freely. But this misconception, and that's part of the public that we live in, sure. we try to change this fake news all the time, one step at a time. It's, I, I, so I, really wanna, I wanna jump in and just say that it's, it's more than that. You know, it's, uh, when, when, you, when we talk about us mm. being the bait of a shark, that's a total misconception. Uh, sharks are being killed, uh, oh, sorry, me, uh, sharks kill seven to eight people per year, uh, pe per, people per year, seven to eight, that's the average. But we kill 273,000 sharks every single day. And this is real numbers. You can check them in, 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 the, United, in the United Nations website, 273,000 sharks in a single day. So we are Jaws. We are the, the most, the most uh, dangerous animal on the planet with no question. Just because of the corona, a lack of travel to Galapagos, for example, they identified over 250 fishing boat Chinese waiting on the, uh, on the zone, on the, the tourism zone in Galapagos to hunt sharks. And there is a major movement now to chase these Chinese and sending the Ecuadorian Navy against them. So the issue of the way our attitude toward Mother Nature, it has to change. And that's the work that I attempted to do, or I've been doing, practicing, and Yoni and Danny and Adam helped me to make this even go farther, and together with you guys, with the American-Israeli friendship, to take it even farther and farther, and that's the beauty, and that's the importance of the work that um, we are here today together. Sure, definitely. No, so I, I think actually we've already, but we sort of can figure out the direction, but okay, big animals, human beings, what's your preference? <laughs> um, I don't have preference in this case. Most of them are um, power of nature or superpower or higher power, whatever you want to call it. Um, and both of them are critical for our presence on this planet. We've both been present here. We've both been evolved here for millions of years we both are important in our career, in our life. Definitely. So I'd like to uh, switch tones for a moment and um, let's go back to uh, making of the documentary. I'd like to share uh, some snippets actually from a TED talk that you gave, uh, Yoni. So if you bear with me for a moment. But that today, Due to technological and probably also cultural developments, post-traumatic victims describe their traumas in videos, in moving pictures. And that gave us an idea that maybe we can reverse this process and help people who experience trauma by creating together with them documentary films about their trauma and about their recovery and about their lives. And by doing that, we'll be able to create for them alternative narrative alternative post-traumatic memory. So we created this protocol which we call docu-therapy and in the past decade we used this protocol with many first response organization in, in Israel in some mental institutions and in private therapy. I even use parts of this protocol in my documentary films, commercial documentary films. And the idea of docu-therapy is to involve the person who experienced trauma in the creation of a film about his life. So we take people who experience trauma and we interview them, let them speak about their trauma, sometimes even reenact their trauma. Then they come to the editing room and they watch some materials together with us and they decide how they want to structure the film and how they want to edit the film. In this process, a victim becomes a hero, and then he becomes a storyteller. In this process, a person 
who lost all sense of control in the moment of trauma is regaining control as an editor in the editing room and that documentary films can play an instrumental role in helping with this transformation. Following Dolphin Boy, I've made four other feature-length documentaries that reached many millions of viewers around the world in many countries. They were translated to dozens of languages and all of them are dealing with pain and trauma and I don't think I would be able to make them without my own personal experience. So Yoni, um, how does this really tie into the making of uh, this movie? How does this philosophy tie it in? And uh, also a question in the meantime, uh, also from the audience in that regard is, uh, how do you think or um, does Amos' wildlife work help to overcome his war traumas? Um, well, I think that doggy therapy is not, a, is not a technique yet. It's more like an idea that, I'd like, that I wanted to share uh, on, on, the, on the stage of TED because I, I believe that 10 years from now, more and more psychologists and psychiatrists will use cameras and will use editing softwares in their therapy war, uh, room because uh, the effect that filmmaking, the effect that the camera has on a person who experiences uh, pain or trauma can be, if it's, if it's used right, can be very, very uh, positive, dramatically positive. Yeah. We've seen it. Um, uh, I used part of this technique uh, in all my films. Some of them I didn't even realize that I do that because it was before I started to develop this protocol together with a very famous psychologist in Israel named Yoram Ben Yehuda, who had been the chief psych psychologist of the IDF for many years. Uh, I think that Danny Menkin in 39 Pounds of Love which is an amazing film, was also doing some kind of docu-therapy with his protagonist. So many, many filmmakers are doing that. Uh, but I try to really work with psychologists and, and, and fit it into some technique or some, not technique, but set of ideas that you can use. Um, how did we do it with Amos? Well, we didn't really know that Amos suffers from, from PTSD when we started to make this film. I knew that he was in a special forces unit. I knew that he was in the Yom Kippur war. My father was not far away from where he fought during the Yom Kippur war. So I knew I had a, I had a sense that, you know, that he has seen and witnessed some very difficult things during his military service, but he didn't speak about it with us. Um, and then one day during the shooting, um, he opened up and I don't think we pushed him to do that. That's one of the things that I've learned uh, while making documentary films about people who experience traumas. I, I, we didn't push him to do that. We just said one day was a very, it was a rainy day. Danny and I were a bit depressed, I would say, because it's another day that, you know, you want to shoot the bears and there, you can't go out with a boat, so you cannot look for the bears, you cannot find bears. What's going to happen? Another day is passing. You know, we have a contract, we have to, to bring a film in the end of the day to the, to the European broadcasters that invested in us. So we were a bit stressed. And then Amos came into the tent, uh, all smiling, and he was like, hey guys, the sun is out. And I said, yes, we go on the boat. And he said, no, 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 we can't go on the boat, it's too windy. But maybe we can walk a bit um, in the island. And even the sun was not out, but it stopped raining. So uh, we went out and in order to, um, to go and walk in the island, we had to take a rifle with us because there are bears all around who can come and they're very quiet. They're very, very big, but they can come very quiet. So we took two rifles with us. One of them was held by one of the Kalujic families who was our guard, but the other rifle was held by, held by Amos because uh, you know, he was, the, the guard was a bit far away. So I almost took the, the gun and just shot a couple of shots into the ocean just to see that the rifle is working well. And uh, it worked well. And the smell of the gunpowder brought the memories. And then he started to speak about it totally naturally, about the experiences for the, from the war. He chose to walk 
and just to lie on a big rock on his back. And then he started to tell the story. And we didn't even, I think Danny was pretty close to him. I held the camera, so I, we, I was far away. But I think both of us were really, really quiet. We just listened to him. And it was um, a moment of, a moment of uh, just, you know, very unique and, and beautiful moment um, where when a person who really carried something for 40 years, 40 years, is opening up to a camera and, um, and basically telling his story. And I think that uh, he, Amos is very, very brave uh, to tell the story. I heard one time that the, the word courage in English comes from the word cur or something in Latin, which means heart. And, and that means that courage, first when courage came into the English language, it meant to tell your story from the heart. So I think he's very, he's, he's a brave man, but he also have a lot of courage to be able to expose himself and by doing that, become inspiration for so many people around the world who suffered from PTSD, who suffers from PTSD, and they see him and say, okay, this is a guy who experienced terrible things, but look at the beauty that he's able to create with his camera. And that's inspiration for me. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Amos, I mean, what was, the, what was the most difficult part for you uh, in making the movie? <laughs> there was no difficult, there was not any difficulty in making the movie. I guess the, the time when Yoni asked me to participate in, um, in editing the movie or looking, asked me for my view. And when I, when I gave Yoni the carte blanche, I said, Yoni and Danny, I trust you, I count on you, do the right things the way you feel like and what you see there. And that was because indeed I am trying to have as much direction as I can in my life. I did it most of the time and I do it till today. I never work for anybody else except in the service. Um, I, but to come to a point where a Yoni and Danny asked me what, what your, my opinion, um, I, had, I had to look at myself to say, can I do anything now? Or should I get involved? And that was difficult time to say, guys, I count on you, I trust you, do the best you can and we'll go with it. Indeed, later on, Danny, Danny in particular, remember, we came in to make some changes, but they were minor compared to the gestalt or the full picture that this guy did. And all again, thank you, Yoni, and thank you, Danny, for taking the responsibility and carry that for so long. And that is probably the one thing that, in my mind, and as what happened to me as wildlife or explorer, carry the mission for very long till fruition, till success. And uh, for that, my greatest gratitude. So Yoni, in the, one of the things you learn, one learns in the army is, you know, how to prepare and train, and then you retrain basically, and then you train once again so that the bottom line is that when you face reality where you don't have control, uh, the response is pretty much automatic. I mean, you know how to, you know how to respond. And how does this apply to uh, when making uh, documentaries about nature? Well, you have to have persistency, you know, you have to carry on, as, the, as Amos said, you have um, so many moments of despair and, um, and when you lose hope and you have to find a hope within yourself. Um, I could not have done it without Danny. Uh, there is no chance in the world that I could have made, made. I actually started this film before I, you know, not, not this film, but I, I, I met Danny, but then there was a time that we worked on Dolphin Boy and I tried to do it to push the story of Amos forward, I couldn't do it alone. Uh, I needed someone like Danny, who was um, a very, um, it was a very special person, you know, uh, and, and, and trying to stay positive. Staying positive in filmmaking is a very, very important thing, you know, because there's so many reasons to lose hope, generally in life. But when you're doing documentary filmmaking, for filmmaking, when you, that's your job, there's so many reasons why this thing will not work, you know? 
And if you stick to the negativity, um, then you will find it. And if you try as hard as you can to find the, 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 the positivity within yourself, this is what you're gonna meet. It's not for sure. You can go to the Canadian Arctic, spend a week there, and not, 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 never see, and, don't, and you will not see a single bear. That's a possibility. We knew that's a possibility. So we had to trust each other, we had to trust Adam, and we had to really hope for the best. We had no clue if it will work or not. But I think that w when you know that what you do is the right thing, and when you work with the people that you love and respect, then your chances are much higher for something positive to happen. So really what you're saying, it's all about the teamwork. It's about the teamwork and it's about the inner work, you know? Yeah. Danny is doing a lot of meditations and sports for a year and, and I also started it a couple of months ago when Corona started and it helps a lot to focus and to, to, to look, to, to find the hope in, in any given moment you can find hope. Sure. Um, well, I think one of the things really that you also learn in the army is basically is, is really the reliance on your teammates, knowing that they're going to be there and do what, you know, that you don't have to look at, look backwards, basically, you know, they're going to be there next year. So, but, uh, but I'm also, I mean, uh, really, I mean, do you find also that uh, your army training has helped you when you prepare for these kind of trips? Absolutely. No question about it. Hands down. It was, it was remarkable. It is, it is something that I took with me when I did, I had another, I had still business in photography and diving and was, I was developing many or the first liveable dive boat in the Red Sea, 1978. And then tech, expanding the concept of liveable dive boat and many other parts of the world to Galapagos and to Papua New Guinea and to the Maldives. And this is the early 80s. And, but I saw the, the destruction on the reef and I decided not to be part of it. And I went for two years working, searching for Spanish galleon in deep water along the coast of Florida, all the way to the dry Tortuga. And then to decide to become a wildlife photographer by profession and focusing on the ocean giant, I had to take account of my own skills. And I sat with a group of friends, about five or six very successful businessmen in New York we sitting together for dinner that I invite them and I asked each one to give me an input. What do you think I should do next? And they know me because they travel with me. And one of them sent me to diamond, to a diamond manufacturing, another one to exotic cars, a showroom, and, and one now to real estate. It was a bizarre night. After two or three days of sitting at the Central Park West, Central Park in New York, but under the tree, and thinking to myself, I said, what am I doing? Where am I going? Let's count on what I have naturally. And I look at my military experience, I look at high school experience, I look at my leadership, I look at what I did photog photographically. I said, okay, let's put it all together, create different kind of expedition, which are for protection of mother nature and for the animal behavior and move along with it and lead the people by example. And that's what uh, the military experience will play a very big role in it. As he said in our good Bible, or in any, uh, how do you say it in English? But in Hebrew, Kititu Harbotam Leitim. And they cut, they turn the plow in, then they turn their weapon into plows. And that was, I have always went after beauty in, in life, after what happened, or what I've seen, or was witnessing, other, uh, especially in uh, the war before, before the 73 war. Um, during the, the, how do you say, the war of attrition, the, the war of attrition, and the number, the shelling that was over our um, fortified units, um, this fortified bases along the, the Suez Canal, which was awful, nights after nights, bombing everywhere, it was, you never, you could not sleep, you become into post-trauma. And then the war itself, I was released from the army and then the war happened and I left the university, ran immediately to my, to my unit, or what's supposed to be the unit. And together we fought in a, in a Chinese village, and one of the bitter battles in Israel history. 
to creating the head, the beachhead for Ariel Sharon forces to cross the canal. I, I did not know that I was on post-trauma, but something inside me turned upside down. And as Yoni mentioned, and I realized I was quiet for many years about this particular issue. I, my internal force promoted me to do something different. And funny enough, as you only know, <laughs> after this, I went to do fashion photography in Israel. It was with the leading fashion photographer in the country. <laughs> and well, fashion photography did not really capture my imagination and my drive or, or the adrenaline rush of the war, if you want to call it, of the military. And I went to do some war photography. But the, the war photography did not satisfy my desire to learn something new or to bring something more fresh and beautiful or interesting to life. And then when I went into exploration and into the, into the water, taking the camera with me into the water, coming back to what we started, I am, a photo I am not a photo I'm a photographer first, not a diver. I can climb, I can walk, but the adrenaline that because of the camera and to bring the images and the story, the visual uh, storytelling, I will be diving or I'll be climbing out to wherever it will be to the mount, to the foothill of the Everest to bring the first images of the snow leopard um, actually nursing each other or to the polar bear taking other photographers with me to create the most amazing images of polar bear feeding on the ice. And then of course what Adam, Yoni and Danny we did and the Inuit with the polar bear underwater. If anybody knows or not, there are 12 people been on the moon. 12 people landed on the moon already. Over 4,000 <clears throat> summited Everest. Only five people been with polar bear before underwater. Till today. So, I'd like to take this actually into a, a, on a, you know, on a different direction a bit. And before we go there, I'd like just to share this snippet uh, from the movie. Oh, I can see that I'm going to go. I'm אני לא רוצה להתחתן. לא מעוניין להתחתן. אביא ילדים, מגדל בית, כל מה שהוא יעשה, כל מה שידע, נשאר בשבילו. באדם שאין לו אחריות הוא אפס, האדם שלא נותן למישהו אחר מה שיש בו קצת למישהו אחר, הוא גם אפס, כאילו לא עשה שום דבר בימה. הוא צחק מול הראי. אז הוא צחק על עצמו. So Amos, this, I believe this trailer was taken of an interview with you and your, uh, with your father. Um, you know, bottom line is parents make us or break us. And what is the advice that you would give to children and the parents among us? Follow your heart. Encourage your kid to, to express their heart, to express their mind, their soul, the spirit, and encourage them to excel in whatever they choose to do rather than try to fit them into a square hole. The mother nature, the power of the brain and the heart, the power, the power of the heart over the brain, it is much more interesting of, or much more powerful and much more, uh, much more longevity and reward that only work toward making money and buying another home or second home or, or, or another car. There is nothing like the heart. I am so glad. I, am, I have no moment of regret of following my heart despite the difficulty and the, beside the hardship that I had to go in order to get to the point when I'm today. Um, and again, and again, and again, thank you, Yoni, Dani, Adam, and Kalujak family, because without them, nothing could happen. And I was able to ask, answer this question and hopefully give light 
some other parents and kids. Express your heart. Parents listen to the heart of the kids and together create a much more happiness, family, and then community. So, so Danny, as a filmmaker, was this something difficult to film? I mean, how do you maintain neutrality while, while, maintain, while filming this Actually, in this particular scene, uh, Jonathan was there with uh, our uh, cameraman at the time, Eitan, and they, you know, you need to understand, I mean, we, we were shooting a lot in, in the documentary. They were shooting there for, for hours. I was very much happy and content to go a few years later again with Jonathan in uh, visiting Baruch, uh, Amos' father, when he's, I would say, almost on his death, uh, deathbed. And then he's telling us that um, we're, we're, we're putting the camera far away from from his uh, bed in the hospital and he's, we're just asking him if, if Amos was here, what would you want to tell him? And he started to talk to Amos and tell him that he's his hero and he loves him. So that is one of the beauty of making a film. Jonathan spoke about the trauma that uh, that the hero faces, that, that the character is facing and he's becoming a hero, it's kind of therapeutic to him. I would say that in many ways for us, uh, making a film, it's a therapy. Uh, I, I, see, I see the therapy on myself because I'm facing my own <laughs> trauma, fears, or any challenge I have in life and creating a film like that, and capturing the relationship between Amos and his father. Because I, I really did not come from the nature world or uh, photography, but I loved how Amos is going all the way with his dream, with his goal. That was, that was one of the things that in inspired me in, in making this film. So when Jonathan and I were approaching the story, so everyone saw something uh, different. And I was looking into Amos, you know, how come he took the negative in his life and transformed it into positive and gave all he has into it. Our, our production company is Hey Jude Productions from the Beatles song, Hey Jude, and the line, take a sad song and make it better. So the fact that at the end of the day, we could finish with a message of hope, with love, uh, with his father even, coming full circle. And the line of Leonard Cohen at the end, saying that there is a crack in everything, but that's how the light gets in. That's almost, I would say, for Jonathan and I, why we went through all this, sorry for my language, shit. <laughs> and make this film because it's really hard. We're chasing after money. We're not getting rich out of it. We just want to follow our heart and our dreams and, and uh, capture this labor of love just as much as Amos did it. So I would say that this film in many ways was a therapy for us. Hard therapy, <laughs> but that's what it was. Um, at least for me, that, that's how I, I felt. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud and I, and I hope the audience that will watch this film will feel the same way. One of the things that I wanted to, to, to mention is that I was very pleasantly surprised that this film is very good for kids. I mean, I thought my kids are, are seven and, and 11. Jonathan has kids about the same age. I would think that they will fall asleep after five minutes because it's not a fast-paced film. They're usually watching TikTok. You know, I don't know if your daughters are also into TikTok. It's crazy. It's like, oh, TikTok, TikTok. I almost don't even go there. It's, it's terrible. But, 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 but really, everyone is about 30 seconds, 30 seconds. And we have made here a film an hour and 10 minutes. It's slow paced, paced. And I am in awe. You know, just before the pandemic, we had a, a screening here in, the, in LA. 
uh, with the J Israeli Film Festival. We won Best Audience Award. 25% of the audience were kids. That was amazing. And um, I'm very uh, thrilled about it. So I hope uh, the audience will, will, be conti will continue to inspire us uh, and we will be able to make more of those, those kind of films that will uplift people. So I must... Then you go to the movie of O.C. Perry, which very reckoning, which is continue on the same direction, which was really stunning when I saw it together with you in the gala, in the premiere in New York. In, in the Jewish Film Festival in New York, yeah. Okay, so, so Danny, I think you need to be careful because the w direction that you're going is that pretty soon your subjects are going to start charging you because apparently you're getting as much therapy from this as they are. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, by, by the way, they are. <laughs> yeah, by, by the way, and just so you guys know, uh, and some, we're getting some great comments over here. And one of, the, <laughs> one of the common things in the comments is that people are really appreciating and uh, how open you guys are and about everything and and that you you know that this openness and, and your and the and your insight basically is really providing them with an inspiration so uh, you, you guys are making a very st good and strong impact uh, you, you know jonathan when we when we started to make a dolphin boy jonathan and i we did not know that this would be a journey for like four years and there was no money and I just told Jonathan, you know, there will be no money in it, probably, for sure at the beginning. We didn't know that we will sell it. We, we sold it pretty nicely to many countries, thank God. But at the beginning, uh, Jonathan, remember, I told him, we will be paid by dolphins. Just by the fact that we will have this therapy and we will be able to be by dolphins, that's how much we will be paid. And, and, and honestly, at, at the beginning, when we were with Amos, we said, you know, uh, we're, we're really following our dream by being inspired by somebody like Amos that can sharpen our saw in, in, in our ways of going all the way with our dreams, with our inspiration, with our work. So really, yes, we are, we're really working on ourselves by making those films and, and hopefully we're becoming better and better and better, which is another Beatles song. <laughs> So uh, before we start wrapping up is, um, I, I think you started to tell us uh, that, you know, you have a movie about, um, about uh, Ulsi Perry and, and which is another inspirational story, but um, just going around the table, the three of you, um, you know, I guess, what's next? What, what do you guys see? Uh, how do you guys see things after, for after the pandemic? Amos. Well, it's clearly that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, there are more and more animals returning to their natural uh, migration line and there are more, more animals are seen in their natural places, um, which that's drive me to think differently for the next, the, the next step in organizing expedition and mostly focusing, taking my skills and my network and focusing mostly on animals that are threatened and endangered to bring them more to light, but also creating expedition which have a research and scientific element in them. Uh, there will be tax deductible um, for people, and pe the people who join me will be able to not be able. I will ask them, and they will have to participate in the work of doing research on the during the trip. That means measuring temperatures of the water under. Uh, about the air, GPS, locations, uh, animal behavior, animal numbers, all those information, and then through some of the leading conservation agency like Mission Blue, Shark Research Institute, and CSAVE, we send all this information to those organizations and they move it to um, credible researcher and um, or faculties in university for them to process information and put them in the data of the world. So from now on, the trip will be more beside the adventure and the beauty and enriching people's satisfaction, but also bring the result scientifically for the public that needed to be used, focusing on threatened like 
the animal of the Siberian tiger, uh, which is not one of the topics. The next one of the blue whale, well, that we had about over 300 thousands of them on the planet in early 19th century and the 20. Today, less than 15 thousand worldwide, and gone also for clouded leopard and other animals such that I have in my research accumulated and creating those kind of option for public to see, experience, and deliver um, information firsthand. Great. And uh, there's a suggestion over here from uh, Charlotte that you might also want to consider raising money through a FundMe page. Just an idea through uh, crowdsourcing. So, Jonathan, what's your perspective of the future? Um, so, during the creation of Picture of His Life, which was pretty much my first film. I started it before Dolphin Boy and before Cutting the Pain and before My Hero Brother and before The Essential Link, the story of Wilfred Israel. So basically I've made four other feature length films while we were making Picture of His Life um, that were, had been broadcasted in many, many countries and won many festivals around the world and did pretty good in the United States as well, uh, some of them. And today I work on a couple of projects. I work on a series with Ehud Banai, which is one of the most uh, um, famous and best uh, uh, songer, uh, uh, singers, songwriters in Israel, Ehud Banai. Um, it's, um, it's a series that is happening during the Corona time where uh, it's impossible for um, or singers to sing in front of big, big audiences. So he's basically taking an old car in 1977, uh, Volkswagen Double T, that's how they call it, Double Cabina. And he drives Israel and, we, and he meets people and he tell his, tells his story and his amazing, um, you know, amazing body of work will. And it's gonna be a, um, also a soundtrack that will be released as a, as a um, and not as a CD, but as, a, as an album. Uh, the other film that I'm making is with uh, another very famous photographer from Israel named Alex Libak, who won the Israel Prize a couple of years ago for his photography. And uh, we work in a mental institution to teach uh, phototherapy, uh, uh, people with PTSD, um, together with, you know, inside the mental institution, but also go out to different locations in Israel and taking pictures and through the pictures, the stories are coming out uh, and it's very interesting. I have two big uh, international projects about um, animals and about um, extinction of animals. One is called Where the Animals Go, which is a big series. And the other one is uh, um, about sharks, extinction of sharks, uh, which we, um, hope to, um, to, to complete by the end of next year. And um, a part of that, I'm, you know, we are very busy distributing and, and showing picture of his life all over the world. Uh, we're gonna be in some pretty important festivals soon. I'm not allowed to speak about it, so I'm not gonna speak about it, uh, <laughs> but, um, but it's, it's, it's happening and it's, it's, uh, it's really nice how something that you worked on for so many years is coming to life. Thank you. Danny, final words. No, I mean, I'm continuing to uh, take a sad song and make it better. So right now, mainly what I'm doing is uh, uh, I'm turning a, my documentaries into narratives. So I'm writing screenplays about On the Map, about Dolphin Boy, about Olsi. And I write some original screenplay and uh, are all are kind of uh, in the same theme. And meanwhile, besides the um, picture of his life, which you will be able to get uh, the link through our website, you can also uh, see more about uh, what I do at uh, heyjudeproductions.com. And uh, yes, soon we're going to bring Olsi also to the world. Uh, we started with festivals, as Amos mentioned, we're the opening night of the Jewish Film Festival in uh, New York. We won two uh, awards already, and then something happened in the world. We freeze the movie, and we're hoping to defreeze it uh, pretty soon and, and bring it, because it's kind of like 
the uh, sequel of uh, On the Map, and it's a story that I also worked with um, Nancy Spielberg and my partner John Weinbach, who is the producer of The Last Dance of Michael Jordan. So I'm very happy for somebody who worked uh, <laughs> about uh, an incredible series of Michael Jordan uh, to collaborate with. And I'm also working with him on another thing that we cannot talk about right now. So a lot, a lot on the plate. Uh, but really, it is a, a moment like this that we are happy to uh, share the story, share the inspiration, and uh, see the reaction from people. That, that That's how uh, we're getting the strength to do this journey. Um, uh, we're very thankful, and we're looking forward to do more with all of you guys. Thank you. So as we wrap up, uh, just uh, one note over here, Amos, uh, what people noticed is that you maintained a good social distancing from the polar bears as you were swimming with them. So you were ahead of your time. <laughs> but uh, thank you. Thank you again, everyone, uh, for this. Uh, I remind you, if you uh, could, did not get your email into the chat, please send us your email and contact information to info, I-N-F-O, at um, AIFL.org. And we'll be happy to uh, share with you uh, the tickets that are so generously made available to us by the uh, Consulate General of Israel, the Office of Cultural Affairs uh, with the Consulate. Uh, so uh, once again, thank you uh, very much uh, for the, uh, to, to the Consulate. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, as we said, this is just one webinar out of many. We hope that you'll continue tracking us, continue joining us uh, through this webinar sessions as well as also through our, our other activities at afl.org. Thank you. Thank you for an inspirational talk, and we look forward to seeing you all in our next events. Thank you.